One of the most famous preachers in American history, maybe even worldwide history, is the Reverend Billy Graham. He was the preacher to many presidents, and his ministry still carries on today, as well as his life. He's nearly 97 years old, and God still uses him. This article might indeed help your church. If you're a pastor, a, a visitor, a member, share this with someone you know, because this can really help. It's ch called Challenge for a Floundering Church, and it's written by Billy Graham himself. I have a friend who was called to be the pastor of a rather large church when I asked him how he liked his new responsibility. He replied, I haven't found the church yet, and if I don't find it within a year, I'm going to leave. Most every minister will agree that there is a church within the church. That group of people, often a minority in almost every congregation, who have personally met the living Christ and can never be the same again. The word church comes from the Greek word ekklesia. This is from a verb meaning to call out. The church is composed of all those true believers who, from Pentecost onward, are united together in Christ. The Bible teaches that we are the body of Christ, of which he is the head, Ephesians 1, 22-23. As such, the true church is a holy temple for the habitation of God through the Holy Spirit, Ephesians 2, 21-22. Therefore, within the vast complexities, bureaucracies, organizations, and institutions of Christendom, there exists the true body of Christ. The members of this true body are, for the most part, known only to God. They are the ones who have their names written in the Lamb's Book of Life, Revelation twenty one twenty seven. They are scattered in all denominations, and many are in no denomination at all. They are called the called out ones, and this church within the church against which Christ promised the gates of hell would never prevail, Matthew sixteen eighteen. I was asked to write an article for a leading British magazine on the subject, What I Do to Change the Church. I would like to list some changes that are suggested in that article. First, I would call the church back to biblical authority. The Protestant church today is possibly as far from the authority of the scriptures as was the Roman church in the 16th century. We desperately need a new reformation within the Protestant church. Jeremiah the prophet charged the people of his generation, saying, For you have perverted the word of the living God. Jeremiah 23. 36. In our generation, the teachings of the Bible are being perverted by many churchmen. The authority of Scripture itself is even being rejected. Thus, the church is floundering like a ship at sea that has lost its rudder and compass. We are all like a plane in heavy weather that has lost radio contact with the tower. Second, I suggest that every member of the church begin where the disciples began, a genuine conversion. Jesus said, by their fruits you shall know them. Matthew 7.20 The very fact that the fruit of the Spirit, such as love, joy, and peace, Galatians 5.22, does not characterize average professing Christians indicates that they have never been ha involved in a genuine experience with God. After preaching all over the world and observing the work of the church, I am convinced that there are great hordes of people loosely identified with the church for various reasons who have never experienced spiritual conversion. The distinguishing mark of Christ's disciples was that the people could tell that they had been with Jesus, Acts 4.13. The great sections of the church today have been rendered sterile and non-productive because Christ's spark of a divine light is not resident within them. Third, I would teach the necessity of the infilling of the Holy Spirit. The disciples were nothing before Pentecost. They were everything after it. When we read about famous Christians down through the centuries, we cannot escape the tremendous emphasis of the Holy Spirit in their lives. The church today is all the tools for conquest, money, edifices, organizations, education and methods, but we lack the God-given spark to ignite these things into a spiritual fire that could sweep the world and help bring peace to our desperate world. That spark is the personal infilling of the Holy Spirit in the life of every believer, without which the church has no spiritual power. Fourth, I would call the church back to biblical discipline. I would not call for a return of Puritanism with its legalism and excesses. However, we do need a new Puritan that will lead to self-discipline, self-denial, and a willingness to take up the cross of Christ while at the same time preserving the great freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. The church has drifted into a dangerous anti-nominalism, so serious that those outside the church can discern very little difference between the Christian and the non-Christian. The scripture says that the Christian is to live a separated life from the evils of the world. Fifth, I would teach the centrality of Christ. In him we live and move and have our being. Acts, 20, uh, Acts 17, 28. One cannot read the New Testament without being impressed that the early Christians had Christ at the center of every act, word, and deed. Today we have hindered him with jargon, borrowed rituals, and all kinds of religious trappings. 
These need to be stripped away so that people can see the genuine living redeemed Savior. Six, I would call the church back to the thrill, excitement, joy, and expectancy of the early church. We have become dead in orthodoxy and dead in liberalism. On the day of Pentecost, the Christians were so excited that the people thought they were drunk. Acts 2, 13, and 15. We go to the average church today, and certainly no one would accuse us of being drunk. Rather, we are accused of being asleep. Wherever Jesus went, there was excitement in the community. Wherever the apostles went, there was a sense of excitement and expectancy. And we need to recover it. Seventh, I would call the church to a new relevancy. I would call the church to a proper perspective in coming to grips with the staggering social evils of our time. I would start, however, from a spiritual point of view. Only a healthy church can help a sick world. Much social attention and action today is nothing but sheer humanism. I am convinced that we cannot save the world until we ourselves are first saved. We cannot change the world until we, as members of the church, have been transformed by the power of Christ. We cannot redeem society until we ourselves have first been redeemed by Christ. One of the leaders of a vast poverty program told me that his experience and years of social work has led him to the conviction that men and women's greatest need is spiritual. This is precisely why Christ said you must be born again. John 3, 7 In the church, though there are those who hold that evangelism should be reinterpreted along the lines of social engineering, political pressure, and even violent revolution, we are told that that's the way to get things done. We are witnessing today the greatest emphasis by ecclesiastical organizations on pronouncements, lobbying, picketing, demonstrating, and even a call for violence to bring about social and political change in America. Certain church leaders feel that society must be compelled to submit to the ideas of social change. They say that this is the major part of the Christian mission. I believe that the changing of people's hearts is the primary mission of the church. The only way to change men and women is to get them converted to Christ. Then they will have the capacity to live up to the Christian command to love your neighbor as yourself. Mark twelve thirty one. We as Christians have two responsibilities. First, to proclaim the gospel of Christ as the only answer to man's deepest needs. Second, to apply as best we can to the principles of Christ to the social conditions around us. The world may argue against us and our creed, but it cannot argue against changed lives. This is what the simple gospel of Christ does when it is preached and proclaimed in the power and authority of the Holy Spirit. I would call the church today back to its main task of proclaiming Christ and Him crucified. He can change lives and meet the deepest spiritual needs of mankind as the only panacea for the problems that face the world. And if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, let this be the day, let this be the time that you make peace with God or allow Him to reconcile with you. All you need to do is accept Christ today. You say, what do I have to do? First, turn away from your sins. Second, you must receive him as your Lord and Savior. Believe he is the Son of God who came into the world because he loves us. John 3.16 You can do it now and he will bring the peace and the joy of Christ to your heart and transform your life. You can have a whole new life if you will surrender to Christ. Start by simply talking to God. You could say a prayer like this, but remember it's the sincerity behind it that means everything to the Lord. Oh God, I am a sinner. I'm sorry for my sin. I want to turn from my sin. I believe Jesus Christ is your son. I believe he died on the cross for my sin, and you raised him to life. I choose to trust him as my Savior and follow him as my Lord from this day forward, forevermore. Lord, I put my trust in you and surrender my life to you. Please come into my life and fill me with your Holy Spirit. Save me. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'd like to know anything more, Simply visit on the web. You can write or email. And if you just prayed this, welcome to the family because the Lord said he will never leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5.